Okay. Great. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Wildlife Wednesday. It's so great to see everybody. Um, you might recognize if you've been here before that I am a new face with AWA. Um, I am the new outreach coordinator and I'll be helping take over Wildlife Wednesdays. And this is actually the last one for uh, the season until fall, but I am getting my feet wet and I'm excited to see everyone. And so again, my name's Kelsey and then Nicole Schmidt, she is the executive director of AWA and she'll be helping me as I'm um, learning the ropes of this, taking it on for the for the night. And we are joined with Rick Steiner, who is a marine conservation biologist out of Anchorage and in Alaska. Um, but you'll be learning more, much more about him and his work in our presentation this evening. And I'm going to jump in with the presentation now. Um, actually, we're going to start with about five to seven minutes of uh, an update of some things AWA has been up to, and then we will jump into, th into the presentation and complete that with about uh, 10 to 15 minutes of uh, Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, we'll go to that. Um, and... <laughs> I love that we're joining Doro's dinner. Hi, that's so great. <laughs> Thumbs up. All right. Uh, so we'll be, uh, again, welcome to Wildlife Wednesday. And this is Alaska Wildlife Alliance hosting. And we're going to be learning about climate change in Alaska's oceans. And just a few details about viewing tonight. Uh, we ask that you keep your Zoom off and or your video off um, for bandwidth. It'll help things stream a bit better. And it's amazing what technology can pick up nowadays. So we suggest that you keep your microphone muted as well. And it's easier to see the presentation if you view it in full screen mode. And if you have any chats throughout the conversation, definitely throw them into the chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll be sure to run those by Rick if we aren't able to get to them at the last bit of Q&A at the presentation, but we um, are hopefully gonna be able to cover as much as, as we can. And we hope that you learned something, first and foremost. <laughs> uh, we are happy to be presenting these Wildlife Wednesdays on a monthly basis um, and we're making them free for the public and that is because of generous donors and members that support Alaska Wildlife Alliance and our programs and so we're very grateful for that and just want to extend a big thank you to those who are out there. And AWA has been up to quite a bit in the last month. Uh, we are covering everything from gray whales to blogs and map the trap programs and projects. Um, discussing that in just a second. But um, if you're interested in learning more about what we have been up to and how we've been uh, mentioned in the news, you can jump on our website and learn more about that. And just a few topics we've been, um, we're gonna just chat about real quick that we've been up to. We are extending the beluga monitoring until the end of May. It was going to end around May 15th, but it's been a successful season. I'm seeing belugas going up and down the Cook Inlet. They are an endangered species and it's been um, a fun monitoring season with baby belugas and also our intern, but the also the uh, coordinator for the Kenai and Kasilaf River. Our friend Teresa has been featured in the news. Maybe you read about her and the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership that we're a part of um, in the Anchorage Daily News or the Peninsula Clarion. Peninsula Clarion. And um, it's been fun to see all those projects uh, really getting some, some light in the public eye. Um, if you want to volunteer for that, you still have till the end of the month and you can visit akbmp.org. We also wrapped up our Map the Trap project and we've been uh, collecting data for that for the 2020 and 2021 trapping season, uh, monitoring traps up and along trails and how that may affect people and dogs or other pets. And through citizen science, we're 
um, crunching those numbers that people reported this season and are interested to find out more um, once we get those results taken care of. But thank you for everyone who has um, submitted any sort of information that they've seen with traps along trails. And we also had Earth Week and it was a, a race between tufted puffins and wood frogs and ribbon seals. And at the end of the week, we had tufted puffins coming in hot. It was a nail biter till the very end. And if you were keeping track of that, it was really thrilling. Um, and some winners who, uh, we had some winners walk away with some Alaska Railroad tickets and uh, some other pretty great prizes. So thank you to those who donated in our Earth Week fundraiser for supporting all those wonderful animals. And Nikki will actually jump in and talk about this really quick with the Board of Game proposals. Yeah, thanks Kelsey and everyone for joining. Um, AWA has an advocacy uh, lens as well. So for those of you who are interested in getting involved in wildlife management, um, the wildlife management process for the state, the Board of Game has extended the proposal deadline for um, until the end of May, May 28th. For the central and southwest regions, so that's everything in the orange. Um, and then also statewide regulations. Um, so if you have an idea for a way um, that you could see an improvement in the management of wildlife, you can submit a proposal until May 28th. Um, I'll be, I'm throwing some links in the chat and I'll put in a link to our website with some help on that, but you're also free to email me, uh, which I'll put in the chat as well. If you have any questions about this process, um, we'd love for people to get involved. Cool, thank you. Coming up, AWA is gonna be wrapping up the Wildlife Wednesday season um, for right now, we'll be back in the fall, of course. Um, but any of our past recordings, as well as this one, will be on our website and our YouTube. So feel free to check out any of those that we had in the last few months. And at the end of June, Coast Light, we're actually a partner with Coast Light. They're monitoring birds that have um, been washed up on shore. And if you are a resident of Sitka, or any other coastal resident within Alaska, there are two different sessions to sign up for that and to become a volunteer to help monitor your beaches. And so those will be on our website and the Coast Lights website as well, if you wanna sign up for those for late June. And a local photographer, Corey, he has actually decided to donate 50% of his proceeds to AWA for the month of May. He does that as part of his business. 50% of proceeds go towards a nonprofit every month and he chose us for May. So if you're looking for some cool photography, he is one to check out and any proceeds from your purchases go towards AWA. Uh, and then this summer we're looking at, depending on COVID, we're gonna be looking at scheduling some in-person nature walks, maybe even some tabling events and more. Uh, we're looking forward to developing our outreach throughout the summer and seeing your lovely faces. It's been a while, so we're looking forward to having some of that. So keep in touch on our website and our social media as well. If you're looking to donate, if you enjoy our Wildlife Wednesday programs tonight and other nights in the past, um, feel free to seek us out on any of the below mentionings, um, Amazon Smile, Pick, Click, Give, and just simply becoming a donor really makes a big difference to AWA and the programs we're able to hold um, for the public. So we really appreciate having you and we look forward to uh, having you here for our presentation this evening. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rick, our guest speaker for this evening as he'll be discussing climate change and Alaska's oceans. And Rick, I will stop my screen share now and then you can jump on in. Let's see first if this works here already. Um, and while Rick transitions um, to screen share, I'll just let everyone know too that we are recording tonight's presentation and it will be available on our website and our Facebook page later. So if you know someone who wasn't able to make it or you wanna revisit anything, um, that should be up in the next few days. Okay, do you see the screen here? Yes. Okay. All right. Good. 
Uh, thanks very much to AWA and Kelsey and, and Nicole for organizing this. We've got a lot of territory to cover here in a short amount of time, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. But basically, the talk is divided into two sections. The first is a summary and synthesis of the science regarding climate change in Alaska's oceans, what we predict and, and what we expect in the future and today. Um, and the second part is what we can do about it. Both are equally important. So let's get, let's get rolling through here. Um, nothing's happening um, for some odd reason. All right, something's not working. Okay, there we are, okay. Uh, first of all, Alaska's oceans are America's oceans. Alaska has half of the total U.S. shoreline and over two thirds of the total U.S. continental shelf. Our exclusive economic zone out to 200 miles is twice the land area of the state of Alaska. It's extraordinarily expansive. It's the most productive, by far the most productive in the nation and one of the most productive offshore marine ecosystems in the world. And it is in very serious trouble due to climate change, overexploitation, and various pollutants. You know the story, I'll breeze through this, you know the atmospheric warming in Alaska has been two to three times the rest of the planet over the last 40 or 50 years. Yet most of the climate change impacts that we're concerned about, that I'm concerned about, are most severe in the ocean. But we're terrestrial primates. We tend to pay attention to terrestrial systems. And yet most of the severe impacts are truly in our offshore uh, ecosystems. 90% of atmospheric heat has been absorbed in the upper 500 meters of the ocean. And that is transported throughout uh, the world ocean. Uh, Greenland and Antarctica Antarctic ice lo loss has increased sixfold in the last 30 years. It's quite frightening and extraordinary. And one day in August, uh, Greenland lost, uh, in August 2019, lost over 12 billion tons of ice. Um, huh, this is not, it's not working as well as it should here. It's not advancing. Okay, there it is for some reason. Okay. Um, both Greenland and the Antarctic are losing hundreds of billions of tons of ice each year. And that affects global ocean circulation. The, the light pink here is the surface circulation. The deep purple is the bottom currents. The Antarctic with all this freshwater input and Greenland with all this freshwater input, the deep circulation is slowing dramatically between 15 to 30%. Takes about a thousand years for the entire ocean uh, circulation to recirculate, um, but it is one ocean, so it's pretty interesting in that way. Um, surface winds and currents, however, back to the surface of the ocean, are uh, increasing. Um, boy, this is not advancing well, so that's a problem. Huh? Something's not working here well, but uh, okay. Wave height has in, is increasing about an inch a year. Uh, so several feet over the last uh, few, uh, few decades. Mid and short term ocean warming phenomena include the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is about a 20 to 25 year cycle, it seems. Uh, El Nino, which is about a three to seven year cycle. And then these marine heat waves, which are episodic, but becoming more frequent, such as the blob about three or four years ago, in which uh, ocean temperatures increased about eight degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, not, not working very well here for some reason, dang it. Um, hmm. All right, let's try it now. All right, uh, the jet stream is slowing. Don't need to go into the physics of that. Uh, and that's what's caused this, this stationary high pressure system that caused the blob, the superheating of the North Pacific a few years ago. So these short term events are being superimposed upon this, now upon the gradual global warming going on. You can see the red in here, it's the high, five degree Celsius temperature anomaly in the Arctic. Here's Alaska, Russia and the Arctic, superheated. The Bering Sea in spring should look like this. And in March 2019, from a satellite here, St. Lawrence Island, Cape Prince of Wales, Cape Lisburn, Point Hope, uh, look at all this open water here. And this should be the sea ice maximum. A lot of open water where it should be ice covered. 
Sea ice decline is about 1% each year, about 30% in the last 30 years. And thickness has declined from about 12 feet on average to under four feet. The minimums, which are September and the Arctic Ocean used to be like this when I lived in the Arctic, it was about like that in September and now it's like that. Um, glacial ice loss and thermal expansion of the seas has resulted in about an eight inch increase in sea level uh, over the last century and it's projected another two to four feet by the end of this century. Ice edge plankton without the sea ice, this is an incredibly productive system underneath the sea ice uh, with diatoms and then copepods, the zooplankton that feed on them. These are about the size of a grain of rice, but incredibly productive system. But as the ice has moved off quickly and not as extensive in the Bering Sea, that, that enormous organic production is not finding its way into the, to the system. There's still a shelf bloom. This is phy phytoplankton and the Bering Sea shelf around St. Matthew Island. It's very different species composition though than the ice edge bloom. Uh, Van Gogh and Monet and Picasso eat your heart out. This is a satellite photograph of the Chukchi Sea over several thousand square miles in summertime, springtime, with uh, fresh water from the Alaska coastal areas mixing and a large diatom bloom. Ocean stratification is an interesting physical phenomenon. Surface waters increase in temperature, a strong thermocline develops, upwelling of nutrients then shut down, plankton productivity declines and productivity of the ecosystem declines. And there's this interplay between stratification and storms. They've got to happen just exactly right in order for the production system to work. You've heard of ocean acidification. 30% of the CO2 uh, that we've emitted into the atmosphere is now absorbed into the upper uh, parts of the oceans, about 22 million tons a day. Acidity of the oceans has increased about 30%. And it will double projected if we're on the same trajectory, which I believe we are, it'll double again by 2100. A lot of the calcium carbonate shells uh, will begin to dissolve. This, this little fellow here is a pteropod, a limacina. They look, sea, but, sea butterflies, little wings here. That they're beautiful, again, about the size of two rice grains to watch them flutter around in the plankton, but their shells are dissolving. They're an important prey species for pink salmon. Squid, statiliths, and fish otoliths, the ear bones inside these uh, organisms are important for hearing and for balance, and they're forming abnormally. Some lab tests have showed that they're gonna form very abnormally over the coming higher acid content of the oceans. We've seen this play before in the Permian extinction 252 million years ago when most marine species went extinct and most terrestrial species went extinct with a massive outpouring of CO2 and sulfur dioxide from the Siberian tropic uh, uh, volcanoes. Temperatures soared, acidity soared, oxygen plummeted and circulation basically shut down. And this on a minor scale is exactly what we're doing today. The present ocean warming, uh, uh, jellies, jellyfish <laughs> is the popular name, have increased about tenfold in the Bering Sea and many, fold, many times in the Gulf. Uh, they're beautiful yet voracious predators on juvenile uh, fish. Invasive species will increase. We have this uh, sea squirt now in Sitka. Um, that's covering the seabed in certain places. This is brought in by an aquaculture operation, but it's just to illustrate that these invasives, once they establish, are virtually impossible to do anything about. Uh, these algal blooms where you see this beautiful phosphorescence generally indicate a harmful algal bloom of dinoflagellates or diatoms. And the domoic acid caused by this diatom is now found in many species of Alaska marine mammals and seabirds, and it could be a driver in some of the problems that we're seeing. Fish, pollock is one of the largest fisheries in the world, uh, shares that distinction with the Peruvian anchovy, uh, uh, and it's in, gonna be in serious trouble. Uh, and the early part of the 2000s, uh, the temperatures really soared Pollock did poorly and the, the, the government had to cut the Pollock quota in half. This is, a multi, this is a billion dollar fishery. So this had dramatic economic consequences. By mid-century, it's projected that 30 to 
of recruitment in Pollock will decline. That's a huge deal. And many, it's expected a portion of the population will move Northwest to Russian water seeking a little bit cooler water temperatures. Arrowtooth flounder have increased by eightfold in the Bering Sea. There are predator on Pollock and halibut. Also halibut have increased during the warm water. So some winners, some losers in this, but if you've ever had your hand caught in the mouth of an arrowtooth flounder, you will know why they get that name. Uh, crab, this is when I first moved to Alaska, the sort of work I was doing, and the acidity mortality of juveniles uh, is a real concern, and it's projected that the crab fisheries, king crab, tanner crab, at least king crab, will probably end by 2100. One of the problems, of course, was the trawlers used to catch a lot of king crab. This is called the red bag. This is a pile of gravid female king crab delivered by a U.S. catcher boat to a Russian processing ship. Uh, I was a foreign observer on a Japanese mothership for months in the Bering Sea back in the 70s, and we saw king crab come aboard, but we suspected a lot of the trawl caught ends that were loaded with king crab were simply cut loose because they didn't, want, us, they didn't want, want me counting them. Salmon have done pretty well since the mid-70s -reg mid regime shift, uh, and that's been good for our salmon fisheries. However, Two big problems in the future and today. The stream condition temperatures are rising to thermal tolerance, exceeding thermal tolerances in many streams, particularly in Cook Inlet. Uh, flow can be reduced and it can be too high with uh, storm surges in, in the fall time and it can wash out salmon eggs uh, in, in the fall. And the other big issue is ocean conditions. When the juvenile salmon out migrate into the ocean, do they meet a plankton bloom, a zooplankton bloom, sufficient to, to keep them fed? If they're too early or if they're too late and miss the bloom, uh, they have nutrition problems. Uh, ocean thermal habitat for salmon is projected to decrease with tolerances by 30 to 80% by the end of the century. Uh, and particularly for king salmon and silver salmon that spend, and probably red salmon that spend more time in, fr in freshwater systems. And of course, all the species that depend on salmon will then suffer as well. Arctic cod, a incredibly important trophic link in the Arctic ecosystem under the sea ice, Norwegian scientists have predicted an imminent recruitment collapse. That could be devastating for the entire Arctic ecosystem. <clears throat> Uh, the ocean twilight zone between 200 meters deep and 1,000 meters deep, where light is very diffuse, is where these little fellows, these are about two inches long, mctophids, lanternfish, they have these photophores on their uh, ventral side and around their eyes, incredibly important, billions of tons are in, of these in the world ocean. And if the, as the surface water warms up, uh, they reach their thermal tolerance, their access to prey is reduced, and oxygen stress because the warm water has less dissolved oxygen in it. And that will affect organic carbon uh, relocation from the surface waters to the midwaters of the ocean. We've had fat rich forage fish decline uh, in the Bering Sea and Chukchi Sea. These capelin, you used to see this all, of, all up and down the Bering Sea coast in June, and it still happens, but not as much. Squid, there's papers on both sides projecting an increase in squid populations and a decrease. Uh, I happen to think it will, given the, the totality of what's going on in the ecosystems, it will probably, squid populations will decrease, although there's 300 species of squid, so some may decrease and some may increase. Uh, this animal is extraordinary, the Humboldt squid, also called the giant squid, it's not the big, the big colossal squid in the deep ocean that sperm whales are after. Um, but there's a huge fish, the largest shellfish fishery in the world is for them off of Peru and uh, Chile and Mexico. And it's collapsed due to warm water and overfishing, mainly by Chinese distant water boats fishing both legally and illegally. But it's the, uh, they have already been reported in Alaska. Uh, they can weigh 100 pounds or a little bit more and uh, 12, 10 to 12 feet long, and they grow to that size and reproduce many times in one year. Now that's mind blowing. <laughs> one year to get 100 pounds of a squid. Um, and the, if they do make it into Alaska in any numbers, they would be a pretty strong predator on uh, things like Alaska salmon. Seabirds, we have about 60 
or more species, 50 million birds nesting here in the summertime, over 1,600 colonies. Unimac Pass, a spectacular place with shearwaters and humpback whales. These bird uh, cliffs and the Bering Sea Islands and the auklets are, are something else to, to sit there and have these thousands of birds swirling around your head. The upper 50 meters of, of the ocean is critical for them for feeding, both for zooplankton and for small fish. If that's not there, they die. And this is what happened during the blob, uh, the extreme marine heat event in 2014 to 2016. This is, uh, uh, these are dead mirrors that were counted on beaches. It's tens of thousands in this area, thousands elsewhere. And in that event, there were over a million seabirds killed. Uh, so seabirds in general are projected to decline, some more than others, but certainly as a whole decline. Marine mammals, um, you know, the, we know the story with these guys. Uh, ring seals will decline. They need ice habitat and their prey, the Arctic cod that I just mentioned, their principal prey will almost certainly decline. There's still over a million trans transarctic, um, but their pups need sea ice for at least a couple of weeks while they're nursing. And they don't, they have this incredible fur coat. They don't have the blubber layer yet. So they need sea ice for their pups. Without the sea ice, they're gonna suffer. Same with spotted seals. These are all called the ice seals. Um, bearded seals, Ugruk to the Inupiaq and Yupik people. And then I think our most handsome of all seals, the ribbon seals, they're, most, they're probably the most difficult to see because they're offshore and pelagic. Harbor seals are already declining and will decline further. Same with stellar sea lions down about 80%. And there's multiple factors in these declines. Climate change is one, uh, prey uh, exploitation is another. And for sea lions and things, you know, there, when I used to crab fish, people I knew would unload automatic weapons into two sea lion rookeries and trawls used to come up with dozens of sea lions in them. Fur seals have declined about 50%, and that's a pretty big deal in the Bering Sea ecosystem. So food stress from fishery removals, predation, biotoxins, and contaminants are all suspects in these declines of these pinnipeds. Walrus uh, will certainly decline. Um, they need ice uh, for resting platforms out over their feeding areas, which are far offshore, particularly in the Chukchi Sea, about 150 miles offshore, Hannah Shoals is the principal area. They feed in the benthos, you know, the clams and, and things like that in the seabed. Uh, and so do bearded sail and so do gray whales. And the seabed ecosystems, as I mentioned before, are in decline because the organic production from the ice edge pro uh, productivity has declined in many of these systems. And the walrus during the summer then with no ice uh, gather on shore at Point Lay. This is about 35,000 walruses crowded on shore in Point Lay with no ice offshore. The same happens in Russia and they post walrus guards to make sure people aren't po poaching or stampeding them. And the Aleutians, Aleutian sea otters are down about 95% and the suspects are orca predation and persistent organic pollutants found in their tissues. With the otters down, uh, and not around to graze urchins. Urchins turn kelp forests into urchin barrens, such as this. Uh, the Aleutian Islands regime shift. Uh, one scientist uh, wrote that no one has ever seen a decline of this magnitude in such a short period of time over such a large geographic area. Pretty spectacular and worrying. Polar bears, you know, if there's one photograph that captures climate change in the Arctic, I'd say it's this. Uh, but we know the drift, we know the story here pretty well. They're great swimmers, but they're not infallible. Uh, if they have it as the ice edge withdraws from shore in the spring, they have a choice whether to stay on the ice or try to swim to shore. And those that get confused and don't know what they're doing and start swimming to shore often in big seas don't make it. Um, uh, it looks like we froze again. I think it's when people are admitted. Uh, we'll, we'll get this started here again. Huh. Okay, there we are. And the Beaufort Sea population we know is down by about 50%. Uh, and as they're fasting on shore in the summertime, the persistent organic pollutants, 
the DDTs and PCBs and things like that in their fat tissue then flush out into their body. So that's a real issue as well. Bowhead whales are actually projected to do better in an ice-free Arctic Ocean during the summertime. Although I do think there's a threshold beyond which if the ecosystem fails, uh, they clearly will, will not. Belugas, I'm, I'm thinking will decline because the Arctic cod resource that they really depend on will decline in the Arctic. Sperm whales, I believe, this is very speculative, but I believe sperm whales will probably decline as well as their squid resource declines. Killer whales have already declined, particularly in, in the Aleutians. Um, and there's a prey decline, of course, of sea lions and harbor seals and other uh, seal species and otters. And also they're loaded with persistent pollutant, organic pollutants as well. Uh, gray whale, unusual mortality event uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the population declined by about a quarter and it was at 26,000 and then down to 20,000. So somewhere five to 6,000 whales were lost in that two year period. I suspect other whale species will decline as well, although that's very speculative, including I suspect dolls porpoise because the squid and mctophid resource that they prey on at night, just like fur seals, uh, will probably decline. Coastal villages, we know the story there. Uh, it will uh, decline as well. Yeah, I see what's going on. When somebody wants to be admitted, then it doesn't advance. Okay, that's Kivalina. <laughs> uh, with sea ice gone and much of the year now, coastal wave impacts in these coastal villages is really dramatically increasing. Uh, sea ice dependent subsistence will suffer, it already is. Um, these folks at Diomede, I used to love doing this with them, going out on the shore fast ice in the springtime and catching king crab instead of the big boat, uh, big seas thing down in the southern Bering Sea and Kodiak. Um, while the subsistence resource is supposed to still be there, at least for bowhead whales, access to that resource will become more challenging. So I think it's pretty well understood that coastal villages, the integrity of them will suffer over the coming decades. This is too busy to, uh, to go through right now. I want to get through what we can do. Okay, so what do we do about all this? There are things we can do. Change what you can, accept what you can't, and know the difference. This is a, an Inukshuk, by the way, an Inuit stone structure that were scattered throughout the Arctic to mark an important place or let you know that you're on the right path. So I guess the question is, are we? Um, two big categories of what we do. One is globally, we have to reduce carbon emissions as much as possible, as quickly as possible. The other category is what we do for Alaska's oceans is reduce other human impacts to marine ecosystems as much as possible. It's the same thing with oil spill restoration. You can't rebuild an oil injured ecosystem, but you can reduce other human impacts to the system, give it the best chance of po possible to uh, rec recover and restore. So globally, we need to cut emissions in half by 2030, get to net zero by 2050, keep warming under two degrees C. There is no way possible we're gonna keep it under 1.5 C, uh, I think. I think it's pretty well understood. If we do that, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere will peak around 2050, and then the temperature will continue to increase over the remaining part of the uh, century. And But then if we've done all this, temperatures will begin to decline by 2100. I won't be around to see it, but I do believe it's possible to get there. So to do that, obviously, we need to start keeping some of this carbon in the ground and in the seabed. The Paris Agreement in 2015 was insufficient. The uh, nationally determined uh, commitments for, car for emissions reductions were insufficient. They're non-binding, there's no carbon tax. We need to double down on Paris immediately. And I'm glad that the Biden administration agrees with that. The Green Climate Fund that was established 10 years ago is supposed to be $100 billion a year into helping uh, developing countries transition to low carbon energy systems. It's, it's not been funded. There's only about, after 10 years, there's only about $8 billion of commitments to it where there should have been over a trillion. I'm recommending that the G20 really invest in 
the climate transition, the energy transition. If we don't, there's no way we'll get there. Same in the US environmental spending. We're, doing, we're, we're looking good on domestic spending for this, but we've completely ignored our international obligations. We've parked about a quarter of the climate greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and oceans so far the United States has. So we have a, uh, an obligation to step up globally. The second big category is uh, in Alaska's oceans. What is climate resilience? And I think simply it's reducing all other anthropogenic impacts as much as possible. It's not rocket science, you know, we can give these systems the best chance possible to make it to the other side of this climate chaos later this century and in the next century. And I think we'll be proud if we do. So, and that, inc that involves prohibiting offshore, all offshore oil and gas, restricting fisheries in ecologically critical areas, reducing shipping risks, marine debris, military security risks, contaminants, and the way to get there, one policy instrument is to establish marine national monuments. The first of these, interestingly, the Alaska delegation wrote the Trump administration a letter in 2018 recommending that all Alaska OCS planning areas be removed from the schedule except for Cook Inlet, the Chukchi, and the Beaufort Sea three. So the other 13 or 14, they recommended be pulled off altogether. That's a starting point. And we should use that. Uh, we, it causes habitat disturbance, loud seismic air guns, uh, uh, under, creates incredible underwater noise, and there's inevitable oil spills, of course, that's a humpback whale surfacing in, in oil. Secondly, when you do expand fishery closures in ecologically critical areas, I wanted to read this real quickly to you. This is from the National Research Council Bering Sea Report in 1996, a quarter of a century ago. It is extremely unlikely that the productivity of the Bering Sea ecosystem can sustain current rates of human exploitation as well as large populations of all marine mammals and bird species that existed prior to the known exploitation. In other words, you cannot maximize populations of seabirds, marine mammals, and all this fish harvest simultaneously. Something has to give. The only thing that can really give is reducing fish harvest. So I've recommended the, to the federal agencies, NOAA, that they institute a climate resilience buffer and all federally managed fish quotas, the total allowable catches reduced, to hedge our bets. Uh, I've also recommended the factory trawl capacity be reduced by half. There's about 20 of these large factory trawlers in the Alaska waters uh, these days. And, and after that, I'd recommend that the community development quota share, the 60 villages of the Bering Sea coast and the 40 or so villages of the Gulf of Alaska, their share right now from 10% be raised to 50%. So while we Americanized the fishery from the foreign fleets 20, 30 years ago, now we need to Alaskanize the economic benefits of these fisheries even more. And we can do that. And that's in the interest of our, all of our coastal villages. Third section is reduce shipping risks. We know exactly how to do this. This is kind of inverted, but another good process, uh, you know, image. Here's Alaska, Russia. The red line is the main Arctic shipping route these days from here, North Murmansk and Northern Russia and Europe uh, across the Northern Sea route down here. But also the Northwest Passage has opened up a little bit and will be more open in the future. And we know that these shipping routes create risk. Uh, we know exactly how to minimize that. We ban heavy fuel oil. We provide continuous tracking of all these ships, routing and areas to be avoided, rescue tugs stationed strategically along route, noise reduction technologies, because these are putting out enormous amounts of low frequency noise and underwater. And we need to have them institute speed limits in certain critical marine mammal habitats to reduce uh, whale ship strikes. Uh, and we need at least two or three of these high powered ocean rescue tugs stationed in the Bering Strait during shipping season and along the Aleutians to be able to tow a vessel off, off a lee shore if it loses power or steerage. We need to reduce military and security risks. I love this image. These bears think they found the biggest seal they, that will get them through the winter here. Um, actually, actually, they probably have the launch codes for the, the nuclear missiles here. Um, 
but there's ways to do this and I'll talk about that. Um, we need to reduce marine debris at its source. Years ago, I worked in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands and the Pacific remote uh, atolls. And we, we were finding all these alba juvenile albatross dead with their rib cages open and all this plastic debris inside, cigarette lighters, bottle caps. This is a little tube used in Japanese oyster. It's a poly, they used to use bamboo and then they switched to polyethylene. So the albatross confuse this with food, are ingesting it, blocks their digestive system and they die. A lot of them are dying this way. Um, and we know the entanglement risk. This is absolutely immoral to, be, to have this stuff continuing dumped in our oceans, about 8 million tons a year or more. Microplastics come from tire abrasion on roads, breakdown of other plastic debris, macro plastic debris in the oceans, and from just uh, uh, domestic uh, clothes washers with all the microfibers of our clothes and synthetic fibers that come off and make it through the uh, wastewater treatment systems go right into the oceans and cause problems. Here's a micrograph, a microphotograph of zooplankton. These little colored areas are plastic debris inside zooplankton stomachs. Um, oh, and back on that, there was an estimate a few years ago that the plastic debris in the North Pacific is six times the amount of the weight of zooplankton now in the North Pacific. Uh, Mctophids, those little lanternfish that I mentioned are the key to energy transfer in the, in the pelagic zones of the oceans are now coming to the surface at night to avoid predation where they feed generally, but they're consuming a, a large amount of plastic debris, taking that back down with them at depth in the daytime and it causes stomach blockage, toxic chemicals, and they're then through their fecal releases, they're distributing that plastic debris down deeper into the oceans. Six, we need to reduce contaminants. And there are treaties to do this, but they're still being used. We're still manufacturing over 100,000 different chemicals every year, over 400 million tons per year. Most of that ends up in the environment we don't know what 90% of it causes. And these, you know, PCBs, DDTs, dioxins, furans, chlorpyrifos, malathion, diazinon, they're all found, many of them are found in Alaska. They're bioconcentrated into marine mammals and some in seabirds, even in Alaska waters. Radioactivity is a contaminant in Alaska's oceans. The above ground nuclear tests in the 1950s and the early 1960s basically dosed the entire, mainly the Northern Hemisphere with radioactive particles that then settled into glaciers. And that, that bomb horizon, as it's called, is coming off of these glaciers now. Um, particularly places like the edge of the Greenland ice sheet, it's, the bomb horizon is deep in the center part of Greenland, but exposed at the edges. And, and so there's radionuclides coming off this. USGS tells me that they believe most of the Alaska glaciers have already lost the bomb horizon. I, I do know that the Matanuska glacier is still giving off some bomb tritium uh, at the base of it. And then there's Fukushima wastewater, the Fukushima disaster and all the a million plus tons of wastewater that's radioactive, hasn't been treated adequately. The Japanese government just announced they want to discharge this into the North Pacific that will come right across to the North American coast and into Alaska over a 40 year period. Uh, there are ways, to, we can't prevent the bomb horizon from coming off the glaciers into the Alaska waters, but we can prevent this and we need to. Finally, protected areas, currently about 15% of land and 70% of the ocean within 200 mile limits and 4% of the open ocean are in protected status. Not nearly enough. The goal, as E.O. Wilson's Half Earth Project has identified and many other conservation biologists, is half Earth protected, both oceans and terrestrial environments. And we gotta get there. It might not be by 2030, the 20, 30 by 30 plan gets us there by 2030. If we get there, maybe we need 50 by 50, but we need to get there quicker than that. In the Pacific, the US has established some strongly protected um, marine national monuments um, in Alaska, zero. Uh, the Central Arctic Ocean outside of our jurisdiction, 
this donut hole here is all uh, closed to commercial fishing. There's not really much uh, risk of that there as of yet. My proposal, and many people are pushing this idea, an international Arctic marine sanctuary, which would have to be done by UN treaty. My proposal is everything outside of 12 miles from shore be in this international sanctuary, which would prohibit any commercial fishing, fossil fuel development, seabed mining, or military activities. It can be a demilitarized zone, just like the Antarctic, for peaceful, non-commercial, scientific purposes, the common heritage of all. And that's what that's a goal that, uh, that I've proposed to our State Department that they carry to the UN and the UN ambassador as well. In Alaska, uh, EEZ, uh, the North Pacific Council and NOAA have established several fishery closures. There's no commercial fishing allowed in the Arctic. These are the trawl closure here, trawl closures here, the trawl closure in Southeast, and various other habitat protection devices. The problem is they're insufficient ecologically and they're not permanent, they're administrative. They can be done away with, with the stroke of a pen and the Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley administration to come. Uh, <laughs> no, not, not meaning to shock people there, but the Arctic management area right now, it's closed to commercial fishing, but that again could go away by the stroke of a pen of the next administration. Aleutian Islands, several habitat conservation um, measures, but all the green area here is open to bottom trawling. That needs to change. Uh, the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, good people involved, you know, good hearted, well intended, smart people, good scientists. But in my view, it's the wrong paradigm to manage Alaska's marine ecosystems. It's a fishery council focused on fish production and allocation, not on marine ecosystem conservation. The Global Ocean Alliance, 41 nations, we're good on time. Uh, we've only got another five or 10 minutes and we'll wrap this up. So hang in with me. The Global Ocean Alliance of 41 different nations around the world established a goal of 30 by 30, 30% of the oceans to be protected by 2030. And they mean strong protections. Um, the US is not a member of that, by the way. Uh, Alaska Marine National Monuments, I believe is the tool we need uh, they can be uh, in five areas we've recommended, the Eastern Gulf, and I don't know what the boundaries would be. Those would have to be discussed and considered. The Northwestern Gulf around the Barren Islands, Lower Cook Inlet, Fognac in that area. Definitely the Aleutian Pribloffs, Bering Strait, and Arctic Ocean. Uh, the monuments can be designated by easily by executive order under the Antiquities Act. Uh, the management agencies would be NOAA and Fish and Wildlife Service. Each monument would have its advisory committee of stakeholders, tribally led, and a scientific advisory committee, and they would develop the conservation management plan for the monument. At least it would prohibit oil and gas and bottom trawling, uh, and better manage shipping, marine debris, and all other pollutants in the system, including underwater noise. And you could permit and definitely permit and protect uh, Alaska Native subsistence, certain zoned small boat fishing, recreation, tourism, and research. And each monument, there's no prescription as to what a monument must or must not do. You can design them to be as effective as possible, and they are durable. They cannot really be undone by successive federal administrations. And the, where they are most used has been in the uh, Central Pacific, Here's uh, the big island of Hawaii, Oahu, uh, Oahu, Kauai, and then the northwestern Hawaiian islands were put into the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, uh, the Pacific Remote Atolls. And again, I've worked in both of these places and they're spectacular and they certainly deserve monument protection. And none of this, none of these areas in Marianas uh, Trench and the Rose Atoll were that severely threatened with human activities other than perhaps climate change. Um, so these were kind of the low hanging fruit for the federal government to pick off and start marine protections with. But we need to get them in here on shore in these highly productive and very, very uh, troubled ecosystems. Uh, we proposed an Aleutian Islands National Marine Sanctuary in 2014. It was declined in 2015 because there was not sufficient local support for it. Um, then we do proposed marine national monuments uh, for the Aleutians, Bering Strait, and the Arctic Ocean. 
and there was no response. That was the Obama administration. What they did do, instead of a Marine National Monument in the Bering Strait, they established something they called, they created this category called the Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience Area. Uh, basically, they removed this area from offshore leasing, not the entire area, just this area, curiously. And they maintained the trawl closure here and, in, and instituted some very reasonable shipping safety measures and established a Bering Sea Elders Group as the dominant management uh, committee to manage the system. But then, of course, this is not durable. A monument would have been. Um, as soon as Trump took office, he rescinded it. And then as soon as Biden took office, he reestablished it. You can't have that kind of, that's not a durable solution. Uh, so that should be a monument in my view. Um, after we included the Pribilof Islands in our sanctuary uh, nomination and it was declined, the folks in St. George proposed uh, their National Marine Sanctuary nomination uh, for 30 mile radius around the island. And uh, now they're gonna have to renominate it or nominate it as a Marine National Monument, which is a lot easier to do uh, than a sanctuary. So in closing, reflections from 2050. You know, what are we gonna look at here? We know Alaska's oceans are America's oceans. This is the, the inc incredibly most extraordinary mar maritime asset this nation has right here in Alaska. It's in very serious trouble, again, from climate change, overexploitation, and pollutants. And the question is, will we meet the moment? You know, this area, this is, here's Japan, the lower 48, Western Europe, and Anchorage, Fairbanks, gas flares at Prudhoe Bay. This is our home, this is our hood, and we, we are, you know, morally and ethically bound to take care of it. Uh, so we need to. And we're morally and ethically bound to do the best possible job to take care of coastal peoples that are being ravaged by climate change and the many species, seabirds, and these, this is an ugruk pup, um, a bearded seal pup. Uh, we have a responsibility to all these species that we are causing the turmoil to on the oceans in Alaska, uh, in, including our walrus friends and spotted seals. Um, so the question is, do we meet the moment uh, or not? And it's 7.53. So we've got apparently a few, a few minutes uh, for questions if you have them. Um, again, the, we need to get to work. We need to all, in my view, press the Biden administration to get serious about large marine ecosystems being fully protected within marine national monuments that would still permit local coastal uh, commercial fisheries in specific zoned areas like long lining and um, crab pot fishing and things like that, although the, the future is somewhat bleak for crabbing. Um, but we can design the monuments any way that makes sense, but we've got to have more durable, strong protections in Alaska's ecosystem to give them the best chance of getting to the far side of this climate chaos possible. So, okay, I think that's it. So I'll um, be entertaining any questions. All right, thank you, Rick. Um, I'll be reading off some questions that we got in the chat. Um, okay. Let's see here. The first one you might have touched on briefly. Um, what organization will be involved in designing these marine national monuments that you mentioned? Um, is there one in particular or is it kind of a collective group effort? It's got to be a collective group effort. We need the same way. I think of this as ANILCA for the seas. Uh, the Alaska National Interest Land Conservation, Lands Conservation Act in 1980 protected over 157 million acres of spectacular national parks and monuments and wilderness areas and, and forests and ref, national wildlife refuges in Alaska. Uh, and it took a big effort nationally by national environmental groups. And it was pro pretty broadly opposed here in Alaska. I was here in Alaska at the time living in Kotzebue for the university, working there for the university, and and people were had a lot of trepidation about it. Um, so that, but that protected lands in Alaska. What has been left out of that are the oceans. And again, that's twice the size of our land asset here in Alaska. These are federal waters, everything from three to two hundred miles. All fishery, everything within three miles of shore, is state managed, and so these would not be affected by these. 
uh, they would be actually they would benefit from these federal marine national monuments. So we need national ocean conservation organizations. We need local in-state environmental groups. And we also need coastal communities and Alaska Native tribal interests to weigh in heavily. It's in everyone's interest to get these protections in place uh, for the future, I think. So um, the Biden 30 by 30 plan that was just released last week, in my view, falls far short. It relies exclusively on federal support for local volunteer conservation efforts and nothing on um, the big, bold uh, federal uh, um, necessities of establishing these large marine ecosystems in uh, protected status. So I think it's gonna take everybody, but we need to be, there will be a comment period through, for all of this, I think probably over the summer um, for how NOAA and the, the management agencies would be NOAA and Fish and Wildlife Service and with, their, with our stakeholder advisory committee for each monument and the scientific advisory committee for each monument. And the idea would be the North Pacific Council would no longer, Fishery Management Council would no longer have a say of what happens within the boundaries of these uh, marine national monuments. They would be advisory, um, but not uh, uh, conclusive on management. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and just looking at time, we are running up on eight o'clock, but we do have just a couple more minutes for about one more question. Um, and Rick, I'll be sending you these questions in the chat later on when we're um, wrapped up so that there's a chance we can get to everyone's questions at some point. Um, this seems to be a fitting question to wrap up. So some of these changes feel really big and how some folks are wondering how can we as individuals help in our everyday life? Well, I guess you know, live light. Uh, you know, examine uh, for all individual response here, environmentally in general, is to reduce our own environmental footprint. Uh, and there's many ways we all know of to do that. You know, consume less, purchase green products, and and live a little bit lighter uh, on the planet. Um, but it's, that alone is not enough. Even if we are the most conscientious consumers uh, in the world uh, and ride bikes instead of cars and everything, that's not enough. We need to expand our circle of influence to others that we know and also get active politically. Um, I think the, the Biden administration is going to be open to a, a lot of public comment from Alaska. There, I'm sure there will be public hearings here. Uh, NOAA just sent me a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration sent me a letter yesterday saying that there will be a expansive public comment process uh, probably throughout the summer and maybe into the fall before they make any decisions. So we all need to weigh in on that. And you know, it's kind of go big or go home time. Again, you know, Jimmy Carter sort of looked past all the local opposition to ANILCA, the Alaska Lands Act in 1980, and got it done. And despite the local opposition. And a great example there is the city of Seward was just in a dither about Anilka and the establishment of Kenai Fjords National Park. And they passed a unanimous resolution in opposition until it was established. And then they realized years later that it was the economic savior of Seward. And then they passed a resolution not only in support of the park, but to expand it through the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council Habitat Program. So uh, once people realized that Anilka was a good thing, uh, it was positive in economically, socially, and environmentally, then there's broader support for it. The same will happen with our ocean conservation objectives. So uh, I'd say stay, stay tuned to when the federal government opens a comment period for this and then weigh in as, as, as um, strongly as you feel, so. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we are closing in on eight o'clock and I have some requests for people to uh, go over a few more questions. If you need to jump off, that is- I'm fine, let's, uh, let's go right. till, mid um, till midnight maybe, if that's all right. Great, <laughs> great. Uh, we definitely do have quite a few um, interested individuals and questions. Okay. Um, 
And so let's see here, I'm just picking from the several. I had somebody ask how much damage is caused by the large cruise ships coming into Alaska and kind of to piggyback off of that, there was a follow up question that said, and what needs to happen to put the pollution restrictions back in place for cruise ships? Yeah, the cruise cruise ships, these mega cruise ships are kind of a double edged sword. They keep thousands of people contained together. <laughs> um, so from an ecological impact, that's that's a good way of maximizing human experience with some of these uh, spectacular coastal areas and offshore areas. Uh, the downside, of course, is uh, you know emissions from the vessel, both atmospheric and aquatic. Um, the noise generated by the vessels, the potential for whale strikes. They, almost every year, there's a cruise ship that winds up with a humpback whale on its bulbous bow here. There was just a naval ship calling in San Diego yesterday with two fin whales on its bow. Um, so there, but there's ways of reducing the impacts. And right now, we don't have a state government that's very interested in that. Uh, so we have to get the federal government, the Biden administration, to be more interested in reducing the footprint, uh, the ecological footprint of the cruise industry. And the same, of course, in the Arctic, uh, there's risk of these vessels foundering and sinking and using heavy, if they're using heavy fuel oil, that's a real spill risk because there's not, it's a difficult thing to clean up if and when it spills. So they need to be uh, using uh, diesel, uh, electric, um, engines. I don't know what these large these large ships generally have. Uh, heavy fuel oil, uh, double double hull, double bottoms, um, and they need to have noise reduction technologies incorporated into the uh, to the rudder uh, to, to the rudder and the, the propeller system and the engines. You know, buffering systems to make them quieter. At the same time, they need to have uh, be more acoustically opa opaque at the bow. Uh, so that they, so that whales and dolphins know that there's a bow of a large ship approaching. So, uh, but it's a good question. So, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of whales, uh, that might lead into this next question: um, Is military seismic activity a significant factor? Aha! Uh -huh. That's one of my pet projects, indeed. Yes, it is, and particularly for beaked whales, uh, Steniger's beaked whales. Uh, these are very, you don't see them hardly at all. They're very deep diving offshore animals. They can come on the continental shelf as well. Um, but military, free, military active uh, sonar, mid-frequency active sonar, MFAS, that the US Navy uses for uh, anti-submarine warfare detection. They were just doing this out in the Gulf of Alaska off of, outside of Seward and Prince William Sound for the last two weeks. Um, and this broadcasts extremely loud sonar sound at the, you know, three to five kilohertz, uh, really low frequency or mid frequency, it's right at the frequency that these beaked whales are sensitive to. And if they're down deep diving, uh, it spooks them and they uh, surface really quickly and they die from uh, uh, the bends, you know, nitrogen narcosis in the, in the uh, tissues and such like that and various various problems. We're looking at, there was a beaked whale uh, mass stranding in, the, in ADAC three, uh, three years ago. And I'm looking into that right now. Uh, there was some seismic activity out there, anthropogenic seismic activity. Nobody's copying to it. Uh, there were no naval ships there. We, we think uh, there were no uh, offshore uh, oil and gas seismic operations. There was no research seismic operations. So we're trying, it could have been a, a foreign submarine doing um, anti-submarine war testing. We don't know. We're trying to find that out right now. But there were uh, eight Senegar beaks, beaked whales, all females that stranded at ADAC, all dead uh, within about a week or two period. So uh, at any rate, yes, the answer is yes, which is why, one of the reasons why the Arctic Ocean per se needs to become a demilitarized zone. Any military activities, training or otherwise, uh, causes an impact, but also just from the plain security standpoint of Russia and the United States and Canada and Norway and Denmark, 
we should, we should be able to agree to make the Arctic Ocean per se a demilitarized zone. There's a number of benefits in that. That makes total sense. <laughs> Thank you for, for that summary on that one. Um, we have just a couple left. Okay. If anyone needs to off, totally understandable. Um, we'll be hanging out here just to cover a couple more questions. Um, and the next one, how do we get local support for the Marine National Monument proposals in Alaska? Boy, that's the big one. And uh, they were, I mean, we were vilified in 2014 and 2015 for even proposing this. Um, I think the, the fishing industry and some of the Alaska Native community and some of the coastal communities viewed it as a threat. It was almost a knee-jerk reaction. Um, whereas it's not, it's all in the interest of coastal community sustainability, of small boat coastal commercial fishing, and definitely for Alaska Native uh, subs marine subsistence activities into the future. It's the best thing we can do to protect that subsistence asset. So I think there's an educational hurdle we need to pass and get people to understand uh, you know, explain that these are not shutting everything down. They're shutting certain deleterious extractive industries down, oil and gas, bottom trawling. People get that. Um, and, per, and better managing things like shipping with these rescue tugs and routing agreements and fuel bans and, and various things. Um, controlling marine debris at the source, which is mainly Asian rivers. Uh, putting out these millions of t millions of tons of plastic debris into the ocean, which travels right across the North Pacific, right into Alaska. We can do all the beach cleanups we want, and they're valuable and very useful, uh, but it's still going to keep coming if we don't shut off the source. And we know how to do that. It's going to take some money, some technology investment in Asia, but we need to do that. Um, so if people realize, I believe, I firmly believe, if people realize that you know, our oceans are in absolute catastrophic decline here in Alaska, but it's kind of been out of sight, out of mind so far, but a lot of the native people I know in Western Alaska get it. Uh, they know that they can't go hunt walruses anymore because there's no sea ice that the walruses are on and uh, they know subsistence resources are hard to access if they're even there. Some villages are moving. New Talk has had to move across uh, to, the, to Nelson Island. Many other villages are gonna have to move. It's gonna be a very expensive prospect and very socially disrupting. So if they realize that the best thing that, that we can protect the offshore ecosystems, and a good example actually would be the Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience Area uh, that we had recommend be, recommended be a monument. The Obama administration instead set, up, set it up as this uh, odd creation of a, a climate resilience area, uh, which has no precedent in, in law. Um, and then it went away as soon as a hostile administration took office, the Trump administration. Um, so if people realize that way to have durability in these protections and the exact same protections in the Northern Bering Sea climate area could be in a marine national monument. And then it, it would be pretty much uh, durable throughout whatever future administration. The, the Trump administration did try to restrict, try to shrink three monuments, Bears Ear, Bears Ears, and the Grand Staircase Escalante, and then this small Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument that Obama had set up. And those went to litigation and nothing really changed. And now the Obama, the Biden administration has asked that they be reviewed. And I think those will be reinstated. It, notice even the Trump administration did not try to eliminate these uh, national monuments. So I think that shows the durability and, and strength of them, so. Great, thank you. And um, to kind of dovetail off of that a little bit, um, Someone mentioned um, the Arctic need, needing to be the same status as the Antarctic. Mm -hmm. And they are wondering who's working on that and how can we help? Well, there's, there's several proposals floating around. That's a good one. Um, I've, I've 
contacted the, the new Secretary of State, Secretary Blinken, recommending that to them. Greenpeace has been working on this for many years on an international Arctic marine sanctuary. Generally though, when they're talking about this, they're talking about that area beyond the 200 mile limits of the Arctic contiguous states, which is Russia, Denmark via Greenland, Norway, Canada, and the US. Um, and just that 1 million square mile donut hole right over the central Arctic. My proposal, and that's, that's an important area and needs to be in it, but my proposal is that, that the boundary come into everything outside of 12 miles from shore, because that's where the most productive areas are and the most threatened areas are from oil and gas and fisheries and all sorts of other marine debris impacts and such like that. Um, Greenpeace is working on it. There's a coalition, it's called MAPS Marine Arctic Peace Sanctuary. The problem I have with that is they're recommending a shutdown of all subsistence across the Arctic, uh, subsistence harvest from, from uh, the Arctic Ocean. I don't think that's politically feasible or even ethically uh, appropriate. Um, so I, I think the, the point of contact with that would be the US uh, ambassador to the United Nations and the Secretary of State to weigh in with them, ask them to bring forward a proposal to the United Nations, not to the Arctic Council, because that's a beast that's not gonna do something like this, but to the whole UN, all 194 nations of the world would agree to establish this International Arctic Nat, uh, Marine Sanctuary with the same caveats as the Antarctic has. You know, after World War II, the world got together 50 some nations and set up, set up the Antarctic Treaty, which protects the Antarctic continent, mostly the terrestrial part of it, from any military activity, any commercial activity, and it's reserved for peaceful uh, scientific purposes for all, uh, all time. And, uh, it's a pretty remarkable model. It can be done in the Arctic Ocean. So I'd say the Secretary of State and the US ambassador to the UN would be the points of contact. Awesome, thank you. Um, we're coming up on our last question, unless okay. you're in, but the um, last one here mentions, uh, says there's, they don't believe that there's much political will and that most folks are in denial. And they're kind of asking, um, don't we need some new ideas in order to engage the number of people that we need to? The political will is a, it's, a, it's an amorphous thing and it's a moving target really. I mean, when, when we proposed these in 2014 and 2015, there was hell to pay. I mean, the, the le state legislature passed a resolution in unanimous opposition to it. Senator Murkowski introduced legislation in the US Senate to require that any marine monument uh, designation have to, go, have to get consent by a state government, a state legislature and consent of Congress. It basically would have completely gutted the Antiquities Act under which these monuments would be established. Of course, that that bill went nowhere, that they would get a hearing. Um, but there was pretty strong opposition within Alaska. And it's because it was, I think it was just a knee jerk reaction thinking there, that we were gonna shut down everything and their salmon fisheries. First of all, there, there's very few salmon fisheries that are done outside of the three mile limit. One of them is lower Cook Inlet, you know, outer Cook Inlet. Um, but most of them, most of salmon and herring, a lot of fisheries are done within the three mile zone from shore, those are state managed and they, they would be unaffected by any prohibitions offshore other than they, they would benefit from such. Um, so there, it will be a long haul to develop a political constituency behind this. But again, these are federal waters owned and managed on behalf of every single citizen of the United States, all 350 million of us. Um, and so Carter, Jimmy Carter had to look past these local parochial uh, oppositions do, doing ANILCA and saw that there was indeed a national interest at play here that needed to transcend local opposition. Local uh, efforts don't always align perfectly with national interests. And when the national interests and the local interests do not align, uh, these are federal waters 
uh, the national interest, I believe, should uh, take precedent. But again, I think we can bring along coastal communities. Um, I mean, look at the Arctic Ocean alone. Right now, there's a complete commercial fishery closure in the Ar Arctic Ocean, Chukchi and Beaufort Sea. And secondly, there's several of the areas that are uh, closed for offshore oil and gas. Um, that's part of a monument right there. <laughs> if you as, if you want to maintain that as a durable management structure for generations, you can put that in a monument, and that's a good start. And the Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience Area is a good start, good core of a marine national monument. Just with the, exactly what they've got there right now, and the Bering Sea Elders Group being the management agency, uh, along with NOAA and the Fish and Wildlife Service. So the core are, is there, St. George and the Pribilofs proposing their own sanctuary. You know, there's, since we first proposed these things, there has been increased interest, uh, but we need a lot of work to do to, to build the constituency behind it. So, and there's a lot of folks interested in talking about it. There's also a lot of opposition as you might expect. The factory trawlers see this as a threat. Um, oil and gas interests, uh, resource development interests and things consider this just as a matter of principle. Uh, something threatening to them. So it's going to be an interplay between the, the positives and negatives there, but I think we can get there. And, and if we don't get there, then I think the Biden administration needs to follow the science and do what we need to do for these offshore ecosystems uh, to get them through this climate chaos that we have caused. So that's hope. I'm hoping that, that will be the case anyway. Yeah, that's a good note to wrap up on is ending on ending on hope. Yes. Yeah, walking away with what can we do in our spaces and uh, moving forward. So thank you so much. And um, somebody did ask just at the end, if you have your proposal posted somewhere, if people want to see more detail, and this might be a good opportunity as well to kind of verbalize where people can reach out and find more of your work or chat with you somehow. Yeah, anybody's welcome to email me, richard.g.steiner at gmail.com, and I can send you uh, things about it. I mean, on our Marine National Monument proposal back in 2014, 2015, uh, we did an online petition that generated over 100,000 signatures, 100,000 signatures from all over the world to establish Alaska Marine National Monuments. And that was presented to President Obama when he was in Anchorage. Uh, it was in the Anchorage Daily News, the Dispatch News at the time, uh, when he took his tour up here. And yet still, uh, nothing. the only thing that really came out of that was the, the, the establishment of the Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience Area. So people can email me. I don't have anything posted on it, but we will be, I'm sure, here in the near future. And again, there will be a public comment period. Uh, that the federal government, the Biden administration will hold about all this uh, marine and terrestrial, probably in Alaska, it'll be mostly marine because most of the federal lands are under the no more clause within ANILCA preventing uh, the administration from um, protecting anything more than 5,000 acres uh, in the future. But on the oceans, ANILCA doesn't apply. And so the oceans are free game for uh, an administration to establish marine national monuments. The other thing about the, the percentages, and one final, final point, when they talk about 30% of the oceans protected by 2030, that cannot be just open blue ocean, deep Pacific, uh, very lightly threatened ecosystems. We've got to have representative, truly troubled, uh, threatened ecosystems on continental shelves in Alaska, the most productive ecosystem, marine ecosystems in the nation, some of the most in the world, most, some of the most troubled as well, protected with these monuments. We can't just do what's easy and call and say, we've got to 30%. We've got to get in here and do the heavy work, the heavy lifting on the continental shelves that are truly threatened, so. Great, thank you so much. Um, Thanks very much. Yeah, we got your email in the chat if people want to grab that um, before taking off, as well as your website. And uh, AWA also is integrating a new climate adoption program, um, adaptation program, excuse me. Excuse mm -hmm. me uh, and that'll be on our website at a 
kwildlife.org slash climate. So I'll throw that in the chat as well. And if there are any other questions, um, feel free to email Rick. I'm sure you'll be happy to receive any of those. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for being here tonight, taking some time out of your days to, uh, to learn and to really just catch up on the recent news of climate change in Alaska. Um, and Nikki, I'll toss it over to you if you have any other final comments. Um, but that's about, that's about a wrap. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for everyone who also stayed longer to hear answers to the questions. And thank you, Rick, for being generous with your evening. It's a beautiful night out. Um, and just before you go, if you want to throw in, since we are in a virtual world, you can't go up to Rick and say thank you. Um, we share the chat with our speakers afterwards. So if you want to give any virtual applause, you can um, <laughs> put that in the chat and we'll we'll share those um messages of thanks because you know these programs aren't possible without the volunteering of time for such incredible experts like yourself rick so thank Welcome. you so much and um yeah with that we'll uh go ahead and stop recording i'll hit that and um i hope you all have a great evening thank you thanks all take care have a great summer <laughs>